So our first speaker this, mo or this afternoon, oh, she's here, hi. <laughs> Sandy McIntosh, all the way from San Diego, California. Thank you. Hello. So glad to see all of you. I love this church. I love this building. Could you do a house like this with these really high ceilings? That, that, that would be awesome. Uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Not so sure I'm glad I'm here. No, I am glad I'm here, but I was just talking to Kathy Adams about I never feel like I have anything right when I get up to do these things. But, and she said I didn't have to have it right. So I, I'm banking on that right now and trusting that God spoke through her. Um, the name of this session is Be Still and Know That God Heals Relationships. He heals, he restores, he redoes, he reboots, he regives his grace. And I'm going to tell you my story about how God did that for me, and perhaps it will give you hope if you're struggling in some area of your life. And I doubt if there's anybody here who is not struggling somewhere who is not feeling the pressure of life, the agony of it, the problems, the trials. I have never seen such difficult things happening in the world before. I've never seen so many Christians ill or sick or worried or walking away. Um, and we need to really bank on this, that God, we can be still. Because God is God and he can do what only God can do. So in order to um, share that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and, and I just have to warn you that I was really boring. I was a boring Midwest girl um, who actually was what you might call a good girl. I was a good girl, as far as my parents knew. I was good in school, <laughs> and I'm not telling them now. Um, I was... I grew up in the Midwest in this safe, secure home where I was loved, cared for. We were church-going family. I sang in the choir. And I was a good girl. I had good friends. I dated only the good boys. I was obedient. And my life was really mapped out for me in good ways. I went to a good college. I was working on getting my teaching credentials so I could be a good teacher. And I was going to marry some acceptable good boy that my parents approved of and have a really good life. And then I moved to California. <laughs> <clears throat> Went to school there, got a job at Disneyland, and, and life was still good. And I was still good until I met this really bad boy. He was playing his harmonica on a street corner in a beach town in Southern California, and my roommate brought him home to our apartment. I had never seen or known or even imagined anything like him. First of all, he was incredibly cute. I mean, really, he's still incredibly cute. He's used that against me all these years that he is so incredibly cute. But he had no car, no home, no job. I'm not even sure he had any shoes. He certainly didn't have any on. <laughs> he was hitchhiking around the United States, living off other people. But I'm telling you, there was something about him. And he began to talk to me, and everything he said was lies. But I didn't know, because he was so cute. <laughs> I know. I'm smarter than I look, and, and that that comment made me seem. But he told me, first of all, he told me he was in a rock band. It turns out he knew like three chords on the guitar and couldn't even play those very well. He also told me he was in med school. Um, and I believed him. He was this bad boy, everything I had been told and warned about to stay away from. But I'm telling you, he fascinated me in so many ways. Not only was he so different than I was, 
he never had had any of the advantages that I had had. He'd grown up in a broken home, broken family. And I really thought that maybe I was going to be his answer. I could help him. I could fix him. <laughs> and in a few days, I was hopelessly in love with him. And after three weeks, we drove to Las Vegas, and he and I walked into the office of the Justice of the Peace and got married in our bare feet. <laughs> and, I, and I walked out thinking, what have I done? Who is this kid? And my last thought was, how am I going to tell my very conservative parents about this boy? It wasn't long before I began to discover many unsettling, sad things about him. But I did have to call my mom and dad, so I called my mom and dad. They were shocked. They were shocked. But my dad said the sweetest, saddest thing to me. He said, you know, Sandy, since the day you were born, I've dreamed of the day that I would walk you down the aisle and give you to another man. And now that day is gone forever. And I was ashamed, and I was sad, and I was worried because they got on a plane and they flew out to California to meet him. And that didn't go well. They'd never seen anything like him either. <laughs> and they couldn't imagine that their very good girl had married this boy. I can remember my dad sitting and talking to him and saying, hey, you know, since Sandy, the day Sandy was born, we have put away, she has a trust fund, and we had always intended to give it to her on the day that she married to start her new life. And he gave him that information, and then he never gave us any trust fund. <laughs> Smart that he was. I can remember when we took him to the airport, Mike said, I thought there was a trust fund involved here somewhere that I went, no, I think he took one look at you. <laughs> and he thought, I'm not giving my money to this kid. But they, there was something about him that they loved too. But all through these beginning weeks, the information began to come to me, the reality of who he was. There were lots and lots of drugs. There was a lot of drinking. He was really a lost soul. I was scared for him. I was scared for me. And certainly there was no med school. There was no rock band. He had no job. He was a high school dropout. But I did love him. So I dropped out of school. I was going to make this work. I grew up in a family where you did not give up. I grew up in a family that had never had anybody divorced, I don't know through how many generations. I was going to make this marriage work. I was going to show my parents. I was going to show myself. I was going to show this new husband of mine that I could do this. I was going to love him so much that he was going to get well. And he was going to be better. And our marriage was going to work. I got a full-time job, dropped out of school. He found some kind of job. Can't remember what it was. I think he was selling cars. He can sell anything. He still can. <clears throat> but no matter how I tried, I could not fix him, and I could not make him happy. So I had this brilliant idea. This is going to make me found, sound even stupider. I said, you know what this kid needs? He needs a family. So I deliberately got pregnant. What was I thinking? <laughs> So we were happy that we were having a child. This little girl was born, but things didn't get better. Things got worse. One night when Mike was at work and the baby and I were both asleep, uh, one of Mike's drug dealers came and beat down my front door trying to get to me because Mike owed him money. More drugs. Sometimes he just didn't even come home. But I still couldn't give up on him. Nine months later, I was pregnant again. But at that point in time, things were so bad. I was so scared that I knew I couldn't stay. And my parents flew out. They were now living in Philadelphia, came and got me, took me home to their house, me and my baby daughter. And there, our son, our second child, was born. And I felt like 
my life was over. I had done the worst thing that I could do. I had shamed my family. I had gotten involved with this horrible man. Now I had two children to take care of. While I was there, he used to um, write me letters. <laughs> and if he was crazy before, now he had, he had stepped off the deep end and he was crazier than ever. And he would write me these letters saying that he had just met with the Beatles and he, he and John ha had written this song together um, and they, they were gonna perform it together somewhere. Um, and that this was how he was going to have all this money to send to me. He was now going to be like the fifth beetle. Um, he, he, I know, but it, it, it wasn't funny. It was just, it, it was so sad. And I, I said, oh, if my mom or dad sees these letters, they're going to have the guy committed. But they didn't have to have him committed because eventually he was found I probably shouldn't tell you this, but he was found walking up Coast Highway in Southern California, hardly clothed. Um, and the cops picked him up and took him <clears throat> to a mental hospital where he stayed for quite some time. And the diagnosis was that his drug was, his brain was so damaged by all the drugs he had taken that he would probably have to be in custodial care the rest of his life. My, I moved back to California because that's where I was going to school. That's where all my credits were. I got a little apartment with my two babies, trying to finish my degree, find a way that I could support this little family, and divorced him. Saddest day, go to court, all over, no hope. He's gone. It'll never work. But somehow, even in that little apartment, he found us. And he would show up to see us. I can remember the first time he came, the baby, David, was asleep in the bedroom, and I can remember him walked back there. He'd never seen him before and picked him up and walked into the living room with the tears just streaming down his face, that he had a son and that he now could do nothing. He couldn't be with him, couldn't take care of him, couldn't support him. He would come and he would try to talk to us, and his he was in such bad shape often he couldn't even say a sentence with the subject and a verb. And I used to, after he would leave, I would sit down and just cry my heart out thinking, this is the dad? This guy? This is the dad these kids are going to grow up with, that they're going to know? This boy who has, is so wasted, so destroyed by drugs, it was heartbreaking. But one day, I opened my door to see him standing there again and he looked different. And he began to talk, and he actually made sense. And he said this strange thing to me. He said, what do you know about Jesus? And I went, well, much more than you know about Jesus. <laughs> I went to church my whole life. I sang in the choir, and this was my big claim to fame. I know hymns, <laughs> not him, hymns. And he said, no, that isn't really what I meant. What I meant was, do you know Jesus? And I really couldn't answer him. I, did, I didn't know what to say. And he kept coming to my apartment, he kept giving, telling me all this stuff, he kept bringing scripture, um, and I just wanted him to go away. Because I, and I told him once, I said, you know, I, I bought what you were selling before. I did the whole transcendental meditation with you, I took drugs with you. I said, all that, no, I said, you don't, don't come now with this religion and think I'm gonna buy into that. I'm not, get out. But he never got out, he kept coming kept talking, and I actually watched him day after day, week after week. I watched God heal him. I watched him get totally mentally well. God's love, God's love was doing what my love could not. So one day he shows up and he said, there's a concert. Anybody see the Jesus Revolution? 
okay, this is when this happened. So he comes to me and he tells me, you know, there's a band I think you might like. They're playing down at Corona Del Mar. Um, it's a concert on the beach. Why don't you go down? And I went, well, okay, I like music. So I had no idea what it was. So um, I got a babysitter. I went down to Corona Del Mar. I parked my car. I looked out at the edge of the water and I looked down. There's like hundreds of people. You saw it in the movie, right? There's hundreds of people there. And I went, this band must really be good. Look at the crowd they have drawn. And um, it was, and I wanted to get back in my car. Something just didn't quite feel right. I said, this is another thing from Mike that I shouldn't get involved in. And, um, but it was like a magnet just, it was like a magnet between me and the water that just pulled me. I was like walking, not even my own, in my own power, by some kind of power that was pulling me, drawing me to this crowd of people on the beach. And I got there, there's no band. There's a guy with a guitar. <laughs> there's people in the water. And I thought, well, here we are again. It wasn't what he said it was going to be. But, but there was something about it that ju it just captivated me. And, and so I, I stood with all these people, and I didn't realize that they were all in line to get baptized, like a couple hundred of them. And I went, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll get baptized. I don't know. I think I was baptized as an infant, but it kind of looks like fun. They're all doing it. Um, maybe I should do it. And so I'm standing in line, and I'm standing next to this big, tall surfer dude. And he says, do you, he says are you going to get baptized? And I said, you know, I, I think I will. And he said, are you saved? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and he said, it's OK. He put his arm around me. He said, I've been a Christian for three weeks. I know exactly what to do. <laughs> and he prayed the sinner's prayer with me. I still had no idea what I'm doing. So then the line's moving, and I'm next in line, and it's my turn to go out there, and I go out there, and there's Chuck Smith. I have no idea who he is. There's Chuck Smith. He comes and gets me. He takes me out into the water with him. He says, he asked me a really good question, are you born again? And I went, yeah, right back there in line with that guy. <laughs> and he said, well, that works for me. And <laughs> baptizes me, and I came up out of that water. I could not believe. I could not believe what had happened to me. I, and here I am in a, a matter of 10 minutes, saved, born again, and baptized when I thought I was going to a concert at the beach. <laughs> and yet it was so real at that moment and that occasion in those few minutes. I'm telling you, I was radically saved. I saw for the first time that I was just as much a ruined sinner as Mike was. I thought, he's the bad boy, I'm the good girl, he can get religion, I don't need it. But standing there, I realized how desperately I did. And walking out into the water with Chuck standing there and taking me, I realized how clean I now needed to be and forgiven. I was a ruined sinner. I was just as bad as he was. I needed to be saved just as desperately as he did. So I got back in my car, no idea, soaking wet. I drove to this Christian commune that Mike was living in that I was sure was a house where you just took your girlfriend to sleep with her. I couldn't believe that. I, he said, I'm living in this Christian community. He told me, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I've heard that story before from you. Um, and I knock on the door, and somebody gets him, and he comes, and I just, I look him right in the eye, and I say, okay, about this, I'm soaking wet, about this one thing you are right. And I just walked back, got in my car, and drove home. Me, the good girl, I was so radically, radically changed. And I now had this amazing new life in Christ. He was healing my broken heart. He was turning my sorrow into joy. He was drying my tears. He was helping me, he, my wounded spirit. He was teaching me how to forgive. He was drawing me into his word. My life was filled with joy. I had never been happier. I loved my Jesus. I loved going to church. I loved my kids. I loved my family. This was the life I wanted. It's all I needed, nothing more. And then... He starts showing up again and telling me that now he thinks that we should probably, these two new creatures in Christ, get married again. 
And I remember I looked at him and I said, well, that would be just a big no. Uh, uh, a big fat no. Um, you ruined my life. You broke my heart. <laughs> Where was the forgiveness in those statements? <laughs> you shamed my family. No. I love my life now. I love the fact that you have been healed and restored. And we can be friends and we can fellowship in Christ, but no, big fat no. But he just kept coming. He just kept asking. One day I was driving to class, to school, and I'm talking to God about this. I don't know if this ever happens to you. Do you ever, do, do you ever you're praying, but what you're really doing is telling God what you want him to do. So, you know, I'm a pretty new Christian, so give me a little wiggle room here. So I'm talking to God as we're driving, and I'm giving him this. It wasn't the first time I talked to him about this. I'm giving him this whole situation. You knew what it was like. You, there, there's, there's no way. There, there, certainly you agree with me, God. <laughs> I'll do anything. I can remember saying, I'll go to Africa as a missionary. I'll live with the bugs. I'll, I'll, I, but please, don't make me marry this man again. I just don't know if I could ever trust him. I don't know if I could ever love him like I should again. Make him stop asking. Surely you understand and agree with me. So I'm talking to God. Do you ever feel like you're praying and heaven's just turned to brass and something's keeping your prayers from getting up there? Well, that's just how it felt. And then I know this is going to sound strange, but honestly, this is the way it happened. I heard this voice that I thought came from my radio speaker in my car, and it said this, Behold, I make all things new. And I looked at my radio and I went, what am I listening to? And I, and and then the words came again, kind of sounded like my dad's voice. Behold, I make all things new. So I get off the freeway, I pull over, I turn off my car, no chance this is coming through my radio, and I sit there in the quiet, and the third time, these words audibly come to me. Behold, I make all things new. I didn't even know this was a Bible verse. But I'm still talking to God. You could make this new, this marriage new, this family new, this love new, this life new. What about all the pain? What about my broken heart? What about that I can't trust him? You could make that new too. So I go to class, and I come home, and I get out my Bible, and I went, I went is that a Bible verse? It's actually two, two times in the Bible, once in the book of Revelation. And I, No, I'm a new Christian. I'm not a scholar of the word at all. I looked up at my concordance, told me to turn to Isaiah 43, and this is exactly what it says. Remember not the former things, neither, neither consider the things of old, and then these words, behold. I will do a new thing. Now it will string, spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Remember not the former things. Neither consider the things of old, because behold, I will do a new thing. There it was. I was now still before him. I could be still because I now could trust in God's word that he was going to restore this relationship. And I called Mike. I told him what had happened. And we began this journey of restoration, this newness, this trust, this love. A year later, I stood in the back of little Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. I took my daddy's arm. He wasn't happy, though, I need to tell you. <laughs> that sounded so sweet, but <laughs> I know. But they weren't born again yet, and they could not believe, actually, that I was marrying this guy again. But I took my daddy's arm, <laughs> and I followed my little girl, Mindy, down the aisle. She was a, our flower girl. 
to meet Mike McIntosh because God restores even the most broken of things. There was a band, if you saw the movie, that they're in the movie, a band called Love Song, they were, they were playing. So, and Chuck Smith was standing up there. So I, I finally get down to, to, to Michael, and, he's, and he's, he's just bawling. I mean, the tear, he's not a crier. The tears are dripping off of his face. And, and I look at him, and I went, how are we even going to get through this? And then I look over at Chuck Gerard. He's playing the piano and singing this Feel the Love song that they used to sing. And he can't go on. He's crying. So I, I said, I'll be, as soon, I'll be okay as soon as I get up to Chuck, because I know Chuck. He's just like a rock. So we walk up to Chuck, and now Chuck starts out. He can hardly. And, and he's crying. All because God restores even the most broken of things even the most desperate situation. And sometimes I look back at that time, and I've been doing that a lot lately since Heidi asked me to share this, and I think about what I would have missed if I had not trusted God that day and believed his word. Because I'm sure he would allowed me, have allowed me to go my own way. There's that word shall in that verse that it probably gave me the liberty to do what I wanted and yet I chose somehow to obey him I trusted God that day and I have been privileged to watch this man not only be healed but be used by God in mighty ways I have watched this man who had no job work tirelessly for his family, for his church, for his God. I have watched him teach the word, pastor a church, lead thousands to Christ. I have watched this high school dropout go back to school, get three masters and his doctorate. <clears throat> I would have missed watching God fulfill his promise to me, his word to me. I have, would have missed knowing him, trusting him, depending, him, depending on him, as I have learned to do these 56 years we have been together. I would have missed three more children. I would have missed 21 grandchildren, 11 great-grandchildren. Thank God he spoke to me. Yeah. So let me tell you this today. No matter what you're facing, no matter what your fear is, no matter what your heartaches are, no matter what your failures are, no matter what your needs are, no matter how broken your marriage is, no matter how broken your kids are, no matter how broken maybe even you are, I want you to know, I want you to choose while you're at it. Just be still. Be still before him. And know this God who can heal, who can restore, who can renew, who can save, who can change. And trust him. Let's pray. Lord, just telling the story again, I am so... I can't, I'm overwhelmed by your grace. But not only that, you have been patient, you have been loving, you have been kind, you have been merciful to us, but also when I look back and I tell this story, you have been absolutely powerful. Oh, the power you have to change, to restore, to heal, to help. Thank you that this is the God we serve. This is the God we worship. This is the God that we can be still before. And I pray for anyone in this room this afternoon who came here with heartache, who came here as hopeless, who feels helpless, that they will hear you speak to them today what you spoke to me. Behold, I make all things new. I'm here to help. I'm here to help. I'm here to heal. I'm here to restore. I am here to do what only I can do. Give yourself fully, completely to me and trust me to do a work that you will not believe. And I ask all this 
in Jesus' name. Amen.